Um, thanks very much, very much everyone for coming along. Um, if it's your first time or if you're back after our previous webinars, very welcome to you all. Um, just quickly, you've got myself, Mike Reed. I'm the founder and creative director at Read Words. And also from Read Words, we have Sam Russell, who's going to be doing part of the presentation, one of our senior writers. And we have Sam Pollan, our other Sam, who is going to be uh, looking after the chat. And we have a couple of uh, special guests for this seminar. Um, we're going to introduce them in just a minute. So uh, hold your horses, guys. And um, just to talk through how this is going to work, um, if you've not done this before, um, we, everyone is on mute. I'm sorry about that, but we've got a lot of people, so um, we can't really have everyone chatting, I'm afraid. So we're going to talk at you for about half an hour about naming. Um, and if you do have questions, comments, challenges, um, please put them into the chat and Sam will kind of collect those and make sure you address them to everybody and uh, Sam will definitely see them. Um, and then we can have 15 minutes at the end to talk through some of those and uh, Sam will feed those back into us. So that's how it works. Um, Really brief introduction to Read Words in case you don't know us. We are a brand writing agency, it's the best kind of nutshell we can come up with. We're based in London. Um, we work on all manner of brand language, naming obviously, but also um, verbal identity, tone of voice, um, UX and digital writing, every variety of writing for brands you can imagine really, um, for all sorts of clients. Um, we call it the world's brightest words, as in uh, creative and clever all at once. Um, our clients range from the very big, kind of Formula One, we did their uh, tone of voice for them a couple of years ago, down to very small startups, you know, one, two person startups uh, across all manner of sectors, as you can see. Um, so there's a really rich bed of experience there. And um, on the naming front, these are some of the names we've come up with over the years. So they range from top left there, Enlo is a uh, crypto trading platform, that's a completely made up name there. Uh, the Wilder is a hotel in Dublin. Upcircle is a skincare brand that uses sustainable materials. Um, so there's a real, again, a real range of uh, naming projects that we've done there. And as you can see, we've got a new one coming very soon that we're excited about for a, a new bank in the UK. Um, so there's a good uh, foundation of experience there too. Uh, and now to introduce our guests, we have um, two guests here. Firstly, Eli Altman. Um, Eli, do you want to say a quick hello and tell people who you are? Hey everyone, I'm Eli. I'm the creative director at 100 Monkeys uh, Naming and Branding Studio in Berkeley, California. Fantastic. We thought it'd be great to have another creative perspective on this. And then secondly, we have Jay, Jay Bregman, who is CEO at Thimble. Hello, Jay. Very nice to see you again, Mike. Uh, no, yeah, not at all. Um, I should, full disclosure, Thimble is one of our names. We work with Jay on uh, naming this his insurance oh, startup. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to be hearing more from both of these guys as we go along from their two perspectives. Okay. Um, naming. Uh, again, like all of our webinars, we're fitting a very big subject into a very small amount of space. So uh, we've done a lot of distilling of our thoughts. And uh, we've ended up with three... Kind of headings if you like and we think we're calling them three qualities that you need for good naming uh, we think you need to be strategic about it we need to we think you need to be open-minded and we think you need to be pragmatic and not put too much faith in magic um, so sam russell is going to pick up first and talk us through the strategic side over to you sam right thank you mike so how do you actually start a naming process well the First thing we should say is um, it's tempting sometimes, I think, with this sort of process to, to jump straight into the creative part, the, the thesaurus, the post-it notes on a wall, the, the shared doc sent round to the team full of suggestions. Um, those are all really useful ways of generating names and those are things that we do at Read Words all the time. Um, but before you do any of that, I think it's important just to take a moment and think about the, the destination you're trying to reach here, what sort of name is right for your brand. The more you can kind of work that out before you get going, the, the better you'll be able to, to spot it when you actually find it. Um, otherwise, the risk is that you, you end up with kind of a random collection of names that are just thrown at a wall and, and you hope to see one stick. So breathe, invention, stem, snow, sanctify, gum, all very different names, all suggesting very different things about a brand. How can you tell which one is right for your brand? What, what kind of measurement or criteria can, can you put in place to make that 
that decision easier for you and your team. And speaking of, of teams and feedback, uh, the risk with kind of just going straight into the naming is that you encourage really subjective feedback. Um, and it's not uncommon in the naming process to hear things like this, you know, I don't like it. It reminds me of a dog I once had. It reminds me of a, a horrible, boy, horrible boy I knew at school. Um, that's understandable feedback and it's kind of the, the gut reaction that we all have whenever we see a name. Um, people tend to have very strong opinions about these sorts of things and it's good to air that. Um, but it's not terribly useful for the person who's in charge of finding that name. You know, what are you meant to do with it? How can you use it to, to inform the next round of development? Now, if you've got a strategy in place, then you give everyone, yourself and the team, a criteria, something to measure the name by to see whether it's working or not. So, yes, naming like any branding process needs a strategy and you need to be asking those questions like, who's your audience? You know, what's your offer? What are others in your world doing? I think that's a really important one. Um, you know, no name, no brand name exists in isolation. It's only meaningful compared and contrasted to everyone else. So check out what the competition are using, map out the landscape. Are there any trends that you can follow or that you should stay away from? Um, because it ultimately comes down to whether you want to stand out, whether you want your brand to appear very different and new and unlike anything else, or maybe you want it to fit in. Maybe you don't have the, the heritage or the history of some other brands and you want a, a name that kind of communicates that. Asking these sorts of questions means that you've got a clearer idea of, of the name you're looking to find um, and means that you've got a better chance of kind of spotting it when, when you come at it. Um, Eli, those are the sorts of questions we ask uh, at Read Words. Uh, it'd be really interesting to hear about the sorts of things that you ask yourselves and clients at 100 Monkeys before you get started. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good set of considerations. I think, uh, you know, it's useful to talk to a variety of people as well to see if there are differences of opinion on any of these things. Um, that it's rare, particularly in a, you know, new entity, new venture that everybody's going to come to the table with the same perspective on all of these things. So, you know, figuring out the decision dynamics ends up being really important too, because after all, you know, a name is somewhat subjective. These things aim at making it a bit more subjective for the audience involved. And that's really useful in terms of getting to an answer, but understanding ahead of time where different people in the process, you know, different people in the audience think about, uh, you know, these questions and other questions just puts you in a good position to understand how people involved might react to the work that ends up on the table. Mm, yeah, that's really useful. And that's, that's something we'll come on to. But when it comes to presenting names, that the more you can do to kind of warm an audience up, that the better. It's really tricky, I think, for people to judge a name cold and just to see it in an email or a PowerPoint presentation. So asking these sorts of questions and speaking to as many people as possible means that you know, people are already in the mindset of finding a name and are already slightly warmed up to the process rather than kind of coming to it and then just feeling, just immediately responding with that subjective gut reaction. So, um, yes, an example of standing out. Um, uh, this is First Direct, uh, a bank here in the UK. Um, and I would say of any retail bank in the last 10 or 15 years, they've probably done the best in terms of carving out a distinctive position for themselves. You know, when they arrived on the scene, they were up against some very, very traditional and old fashioned and slightly stuffy sounding brands like Lloyds Bank and National Westminster Bank. Now, First Direct, when you compare it to those, feels, feels different and fresh and challenging, which is, which is perfect for a brand that's all about being different and fresh and challenging. Whereas, let's say you want to fit in, well, you can take a leaf out of the Wolf of Wall Street's book. Um, when he set up his brokerage firm, he called it Stratton Oakmont, which is probably the most bland and corporate name you could possibly land upon. It doesn't really mean anything, but it does suggest established and trustworthy and traditional, even if the underlying business was none of those things. So asking those sorts of questions is a really useful way of kind of figuring out what sort of name am I looking to find? To show you an example of a project we worked on recently, this was last year um, for a financial brand called Exotics Capital. Um, and they were undergoing quite a big change in, in their business model. Um, previously, they'd been a, a very sort of traditional investment firm that focused on developing and emerging markets. And they were becoming a kind of intelligence platform where they bring together insights from around the world and, and kind of serve those up to other investors to use. 
Now, as you can see, exotics doesn't suggest any of that. It doesn't suggest intelligence. It doesn't suggest digital or community. And for a brand in, in 2019, 2020, it comes with a load of cultural baggage and associations that you don't want to be associated with, particularly if you're investing in, in emerging markets. So the first thing we did is, is look at that landscape and see what the competition were using. And you can see some trends here starting to emerge. You know, the word capital is a pretty obvious one. Um, some slightly sort of premium kind of expensive sounding words like Renaissance. We have a founder name like Oppenheimer. That's obviously a big trend in, in financial brands using the name of a founder. Um, some acronyms EFG. So th there was an opportunity there to, to stand out, to break them all, to appear different. But at the same time, the client was really mindful that they didn't want to appear too radical, too different because they built up years of expertise and credibility and they didn't want a name that kind of undercut that or made them seem kind of new and, and, and kind of a bit, yeah, not quite as expert as they previously had been. So the name we landed upon after a, a process of a couple of months is Telema. Um, that's obviously a made up name, a made up word. It comes from intelligence and emerging, which is obviously right for a, for a brand that's all about those things. Um, and the reason the client really warmed to it and chose it in the end out of a shortlist is that it struck that fine balance between being sort of disruptive and feeling different to those com competitors, but not feeling scary, not feeling daunting as though it was very different or very new, because it still suggests authority and, and establishment. Um, in fact, actually the client liked the way that it it potentially sounds like a surname, like it, it could be the surname of, of the founder, um, but it also sounds fresh and innovative and, and kind of suggests digital and intelligence. Now, there's no way we would have arrived at that name without having that strategic process behind it, without having asked those questions at the beginning. Now, that's kind of an example of a, a renaming job rather than naming from scratch. Um, and I think in our experience, and I think Eli, in your experience as well, these are often the trickiest jobs um, because they tend to be for larger, more established companies. So inevitably they involve more people, more opinions. Um, some of those people will be really attached to the old name. They might have grown up with it, so to speak, and, and have a hard time kind of letting go. Or there might be merger politics involved. You might be getting two brands coming together that's a different beast to tackle uh, and requires a slightly different approach to, to naming from scratch and that's where people management comes into play uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later on about how you can manage all those different opinions and get people on board and, and get them behind a name. So that's about how, how you start the project, how you can be strategic and make sure you find a name that's going to work for your brand. Our next quality is open-minded and for that I'm going to hand back to Mike. Thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, so we think it's really important to um, kind of balance the strategic side and remembering all that strategic grounding with an open mindedness to uh, the creative possibilities, which are obviously kind of dauntingly vast in a naming project. Um, so obviously you start with that strategy that you've spent the time working out. You keep thinking about objectives, look at the competitors, think about the context, all that kind of thing. You know, how are we going to fit in or not into this? Um, and we find it really useful to use that to create some initial territories, creative territories that we can explore. So um, questions we ask uh, would include things like, you know, what's our core proposition for this brand? What are we really offering? It's an obvious one. Um, what are the values of the brand? What do we stand for? What do we believe in? Maybe there's um, strands in that that we want to uh, pull on. Um, how will this thing make people feel? Is it a product that makes them you know is delicious or is it something that makes them feel less anxious you know that kind of stuff um and why does it matter what's what's it bringing to the world that the world doesn't have already and why is that important and what is there something in the name that could bring that out um eli i was wondering if you had any other questions quickly that you chuck in at this point um i think Sometimes it can be really useful to think about the name relative to other elements of the brand. Um, a lot of people at this point try to pack that list with as many things as they possibly can to try to make the name do a lot of work. Um, but as we all know, sort of definitionally, names and words can really only communicate so many things at a time. While uh, you know a brand is capable of holding that level of meaning, um, and so thinking about 
you know, which of the things a brand is looking to communicate are best suited to be communicated in the name relative to other aspects of the visual identity, other pieces of writing, things like that. Yeah, that's a really good point. And uh, yes, I should clarify, wasn't it? <laughs> Don't think a, a name can do all of these things, but um, and that's absolutely right. You know, you think about the whole context of the brand and what it's all gonna do together. Um, but yeah, asking these kinds of brand focused questions, strategically focused questions, I think we find helps pull out some kind of core territories that at least give you starting points for the thinking. Um, and the, the starting point is the uh, important bit really, because although they're really useful to get your brain going, um, you shouldn't feel too kind of bound in by them. They should be, if you like, more signpost than fence post. Um, and beyond them, you can start, you, you should stay open to all the, um, possibilities that come come along as I say and try not to censor the process especially really early on where you're kind of you are generating a lot of ideas um, and feel free to follow the kind of what I call the webs of associations that come with these words and that literally the word association thing that happens and um, even when you get to a point where you think I'm miles away from my original start point um, and this is not relevant I think it's really worth remembering that the, the subconscious is a powerful thing and and because you've got this brand in your head and, and you're thinking about it the subconscious is often making connections that you're very unaware of um, and connections that actually your audience may well make subconsciously later once the name is out there as well so um just a really simple illustration of what that mm -hmm. process might sort of look like in a way is if you had uh, like a territory around security and feeling secure for example that could lead you in all sorts of funny ways you know, keys and locks and prisons and things were really, really obvious. But then the word key might remind you of key for, you know, that sounds the same um, for a dock or a marina. And that might lead you into boats and fishing and goodness knows what. Um, but maybe you end up with Marlin and you decide for various reasons that's actually a really good name. And you would never get there if you kind of went, oh, hang on, boating has nothing to do with security. So we should stop that line of thought. Um, or you maybe go off onto kind of fences and bricks and walls and wood and wood takes you to forest and forest takes you to fairy tales and you end up with beanstalk which funnily enough was one of the names we presented to jay when we were thinking about thimble um we've often wondered as the clients whether there is some cache of names that you guys have that you <laughs> quite selectively okay well nobody's taken that one yet but we love it and we're so anyway uh, that's a trade secret um, um it's possible and um, but yeah i think the, the key point is that you don't uh, when you start to feel like you're drifting a long way, don't necessarily stop and think, oh, I'm, I'm too far out. Because um, it's often you have to go all the way out in order to come back. Um, so keep, keep the open mind on that one. Um, and we often get those trains of thoughts will kind of seem to dry up or you'll feel like, oh, I've, you know, I've got nothing else left. And it, you want to kind of unstick your brain. And um, when you get to that point, we just have some really simple exercises that we uh, chuck in. Um, things that s seem random, but just allow your brain to kind of come at it in a different way. So I do things like um, maybe only try and think of words that start with a particular letter. And it does not matter which one. Um, or maybe you think, well, what if, what if it had to be an animal name? What animal names would fit? Or what might be the worst name possible? I, I think that's often quite useful. You know, why would X be a really terrible name for this? And, and the reasons why it's terrible often point you to what might be better. Um, if it was something else, if it, you were trying to name, I don't know, um, a, a food, you know, what if it was a car or a, or a bank? You know, how would how would that affect the way you're thinking about it? It just allows your brain to kind of reorientate itself and get out of the rut that it's got into. Um, again, Eli, I'm uh, going to pick your brain on this one. Are there any other you know, useful exercises that you guys use? Yeah, definitely. Um, we like to play the Wikipedia game um, where you go to a sort of related page on Wikipedia and then you navigate around only by clicking links. Um, it's sort of a... a a virtual way of playing that kind of word map that you had um, a couple pages ago. And then, uh, I mean, one other note on, on your previous page in terms of like not, you know, getting, to, you know, or not stopping your trains of thought and letting those run through. Um, it's just sort of like the separation of writing and editing, right? At some point, you're just trying to get ideas down. And when you're yeah. trying to get ideas down, it's not in your best interest to edit yourself on the fly. Leave that for later. That's a whole other process. It's okay to write garbage names down. Just <laughs> let that happen and, you know, deal with the other part later. 
Yeah, absolutely agree. It's the old thing, isn't it? There are no bad ideas at this point. Um, no, dead right. Uh, the Wikipedia thing is good. I'm going to steal that, definitely. Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, again, I know Eli has a thought on this, which we might come back to in the Q&A, but um, we also will, unless there's a kind of real prohibition against made up words, completely made up words, we'll try those as well and just kind of almost literally st stick letters together and stick sounds together and see if they feel right. You know, that, that's a very subjective thing, obviously, but um, there are certain words or rather sounds that are clearly harder than others or softer than others or feel kind of make you feel a bit happier or a little more serious or whatever. Um, and you can use those as part of the thinking process or even to kind of actually create a name just to sort of start thinking about phonetics of the name and how it can um, work and how different bits of a name might fit together. You know, we might have a soft and a hard thing sort of bumping up together in a useful way. So, you know, don't feel like you necessarily have to have actual words all the time. You could just start playing with sounds and letters um, yeah so keep everything on the table um, and don't forget you know the good names come in just about every form you can imagine if you think about the, the brands we have out there you know some are super descriptive you know whole foods is a very clear description of what they're offering seven up means virtually nothing i don't you know there is a whole story about how that name came about but i can't remember what it is but you know seven up has nothing to do with busy drinks so don't censor yourself, keep an open mind, um, and that's how you often you come up with the kind of unexpected left field stuff that turns out to be really powerful. Um, there are so many options of the sorts of names that are out there. So you know you can think about these as threads. It might be a useful and un unjamming thing again. Um, there's again, there's the made up words like Kodak means nothing, and Monzo doesn't mean anything, even though it kind of hints to Mondo. Um, there are actual people's names, you know, Marcus or Harry. Uh, composite names are really useful. Uh, portmanteau is a kind of posh word. Net and flicks come together, pin and interest. Um, or the other way around, taking words apart and using bits of them. So, avocado in the UK comes from avocado. Um, Pepsi comes from when the, the founder thought that it was a treatment for dyspepsia, and Pepsi come out of that. Um, or use your purpose, use the thing you're here for. So innocent drinks, again, in, in the UK are all about kind of um, no added anything, you know, natural fruity stuff. So it's innocent or impossible burger. You might want associations with uh, Nike is the goddess of victory. So that's perfect for Nike. You know, Uber is the word for something that's better than any of the others. That kind of association is useful. Maybe an acronym, um, less emotional, but you never know. Um, or just crazy names, you know, Moonpig is, is the uh, greetings card company, but there's no reason why it should be called Moonpig, it's just fun. So, you know, use all of these threads, think about all of those. Um, and remember that there are plenty of names out there that you kind of feel like would never get through a, a, a client workshop or a focus group these days. You know, calling a company Virgin um, just seems to have everything against it. You know, it's about sex, it's about religion, it's about lack of sex, you know, it's all, all the bad things, but none of us worries about any of that stuff now. Um, it's just a company that you know, runs an airline or um, runs your bank even, and people are quite happy to accept that. So don't kind of panic too much about um, all the possible meanings and uh, overthinking those possible negative interpretations. Anyone who's been through a naming process will have had stuff chucked back at them about, well, what, some people might think this, or it might, people might worry about that. You know, McDonald's is a classic, you know, it's got nothing to do with Scotland. No one worries that it is that a Scottish brand I don't understand. Um, no one thinks that. Um, no one worries anymore that Apple might be a kind of too gentle a word for computing. Um, so you'll hear these kinds of objections and occasionally they might be important. You know, no one's going to call anything ISIS for a while for good reason. But a lot of the kind of over-interpretative stuff is actually distracting. And what worry, what matters a lot more is the meaning that goes into that name as it becomes a brand, all the stuff, as Eli mentioned before, all the other stuff that goes around the name, the visual identity, the work that that brand does, the products it puts out, um, you know, all its other comms will feed meaning into that in the same way that meaning has uh, gravitated into Virgin or Apple from what that brand does. So yeah, don't worry too much about that. And of course, some names start off not meaning anything at all. Um, Xerox, is a classic, you know, Ikea is a combination of initials, but doesn't actually mean anything. 
haagen was deliberately created to mean nothing but sound kind of foreign and um, interesting and sophisticated. Um, so yeah, it, don't get too bound up with what words might mean to some people um, because you know it's the meaning that you build into them that's going to matter more than that. Um, Eli, you had a point on this, uh, which I thought was interesting about um, the dangers of sort of meaningless words, particularly, I think, for small businesses. You want to talk to that for a second? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's something called the mere exposure effect um, in psychology, which just kind of means that uh, we have more favorability and recognition with things that we understand and have associations for. And when you're a massive business and you can put a huge budget behind somebody getting to a place where they understand a word that they've never seen before, like Verizon or something like that, then there's certain you know, advantages in that situation because you can protect something legally in ways that you could never protect uh, a sort of combination or variation on you know, naturally occurring words. But if you're a small business and you don't have that budget, oftentimes, you know, and there's caveats here and many sort of uh, exceptions that prove the rule. Um, but oftentimes it can be really difficult for people to remember, understand, pronounce uh, words that they've never seen before because they don't really have any anchors for those words. Um, they're not mentally, they're not going to connect them to things other than, you know, potentially things they might sound like. So, you know, while this isn't exclusive and there are absolutely situations where um, making up words makes sense. Um, it's something where you probably want to be pretty careful with how you do it. Um, and also sometimes I find that it can be uh, difficult in the process of naming to sort of go down this path uh, as well as trying to find natural words because it's just kind of uh, operating in a different part of your brain. Um, so, you know, not to say don't, but uh, it's something you need to sort of exercise some caution while doing. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, great, thank you. So that brings us to the third section, which I'm gonna hand back to Sam for talk about the pragmatics. Super, thanks Mike. So yes, we wanted to finish on this quality because um, a, a lot of a naming process is, is frankly a bit boring um, and getting the kind of technical stuff right and making sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Um, the reason why we said it's not magic is that um, I think some people have the, well, there's a myth about naming that it, it's all about flashes of inspiration and moments of genius where you, you sort of spot the name that's, that's perfect. Um, and I think we would say that on, on very, very few occasions does that ever really happen. There's almost never that silver bullet, um, the one name that sums up everything your brand is about. So it's often more about compromising slightly and finding a short list of names that all work to some degree and all fit the strategy to some degree and then weighing up the pros and cons and kind of choosing which name you think meets more of those those criteria um, jay i you've you've just been through this process with with thimble which starts out life as verifly um, and yes. it'd be interesting to hear about how you approach this and whether you started off kind of wanting that perfect name or whether you kind of realized it wasn't going to be a kind of a moment of inspiration. Yeah, so we started off um, with this name Verify, which is really perfect for selling drone insurance to, um, uh, to pilots that wanted to protect uh, against the liability of, of their flights. Uh, but then we started selling these pilots who were also real estate uh, developers and photographers and construction workers other types of insurance and no one could really understand the name. We felt that there was a real big problem. And it was also, I guess, internally, we felt that, it, that the name didn't really reflect the boldness of what we wanted to do. It would be very hard to, to evolve it to do so. So uh, we, we wanted to do a rebranding and, and a renaming. Um, and so I, I think it was, a, it was probably one of the toughest that I've done in, in my career, uh, simply because even though Verify was a, not a really great name, certainly not a great name for what it was that we were doing, there is this unconscious um, uh, kind of love that people have for the company name. And if there isn't a real compelling reason to change it, like we've got a trademark dispute or we've been acquired or something like that, people always will come back to, well, do we really have to do this? You know, it's not really being forced on upon us. So, uh, so I think we needed to demonstrate that there was a name that was materially better uh, and that was a really painful process 
Uh, we saw Thimble on a list of 10 names. That was the first thing. I, I, by the way, I wrote a, a, a Medium post on this that you guys might enjoy. We'll send it out afterwards. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think the, the, the hardest thing about this, when you have a name, is you're always trying to compare it to the name, but it's never quite comparable. Um, and so um, I agree that, that it's never a question of, uh, or it hasn't been in my experience, a question of the silver bullet. It's a question of, you know, the name that you will eventually love was number three on that list. Actually, uh, you know, and then it took two more rounds of names for you to see that actually uh, this name, which when I heard about it, all I thought of was the, the Monopoly piece, which uh, apparently doesn't even exist anymore. Um, but it, it evolved into something that I think was was perfect uh, was perfect for us. But uh, what a journey it was to get there. So, <laughs> yeah, great. That, that's really useful. I think, yeah, talking about it being a painful process is definitely something we hear about the. I think it's all the user experience of being a, someone picking a name is, is a tricky one because you're right, you, you're always comparing to what you've got. And if there is no reason why you're being forced to do it, it can seem like a lot of heartache um, to, to find a name. Um, the other challenge I think that what we found is, you know, so Kayla was a previous business of mine, which we, we knew we only had to make work on the app store. And there were just, there were not many apps in, in 2010. So it wasn't that hard the sort of battle space that you need to navigate now for name has to work in the app store. It's got to work at Google. So it work all of these other places. Um, and if there are other, you know, properties out there, it becomes more challenging, et cetera. So I think that has made the whole process just, uh, you know, just a much more difficult. Yeah, definitely. And, and so speaking of that, that battle, um, as I said, that um, naming isn't just creativity and strategy. It comes with a lot of really boring hoops that you have to jump through, like checking for trademark conflicts or avoiding translation problems. And um, we'll take these one by one. Um, when it comes to, to checking for trademark conflicts, obviously Google should be your first port of call. Just pop your name in there and see what comes back. See if there are any brands in exactly the same space or slightly adjacent spaces and figure out what that means for your potential name. You can refine things a little bit more by searching for your name. Let's say it's Lemon and your industry. Let's say that's fashion. That might throw up some potential challenges. Once you've done that initial sweep, then, then we move on to trademark checkers. Um, and the two we tend to use are for, for brands that are launching in the UK. We use gov.uk's trademark checker. For brands that need to work globally, we use TM View. That's obviously a more complex challenge um, and TM view is really great for telling you the different classes that are available the different sectors that a name might have been registered registered in and kind of showing you whether there's space for you to use the name too but then for that extra security and peace of mind that's when legal advice comes in as brand writers we can take it so much of the way but to really make sure about a name that's where you need a, an IP lawyer to get involved um, in terms of avoiding translation problems, if, if you're a global brand and you need the name to work beyond English, um, it's really important to remember the lesson of the Ford Pinto or the Ford Small Genitals, as it's known in, in Brazil. Um, this was because Ford hadn't done, done their homework, didn't realize the, the different connotations that that word has in Brazilian Portuguese. Um, we use a website called wordsafety.com to avoid those sorts of embarrassing mistakes. That, that flags across 19 languages whether a word means something that you, you don't want it to mean. Um, in terms of searching for URLs, as, as Jay said, sometimes that might not always be essential if it's, if it's going to be app only or at least most of your traffic is going to visit the app rather than the website. Um, we tend to use uh, namecheck.com. I know uh, Eli uses gandhi.net. They're really useful for just telling you if a website, if a domain already, uh, if someone already owns a domain, um, in which case you can try alternatives like this is lemon.com or we are lemon.com. But also to remember that, you know, dot coms are great, but they're not essential and that very few of us type them out letter by letter. Instead, kind of most of us will be di directed through search. And then finally, the expectation and the people management side of things. So if you're, if you're responsible for finding a name and reporting to a large team of stakeholders, the founder, the CEO, the chairman, whoever it might be, how do you get those people on board? The first thing to do is to really encourage them to keep subjectivity at bay. And that is a phenomenally hard thing, that hard thing to do, I think, because people tend to respond really subjectively with those gut reactions. So how can you do that? You can kind of encourage people to, to slightly step outside of that subjectivity, to present a name, not cold, not in an email, not in a PowerPoint slide, but to, 
to walk people through the process, show them the territories, show them the strategy so that your conclusion feels more, more logical and kind of rigorous. Um, something we do at Read Words is to put the name into context. So whether that's on a mocked up homepage or uh, maybe it's on a business card or uh, we ask people to imagine answering the phone with the brand name. All those things can help people make the leap of imagination that you sometimes need to do from particularly from a from an existing name to a new name that might feel very unfamiliar and alien and obviously giving people time to sleep on this is invaluable as Jay said I think you know you, you might go back and find that the name that was third favorite on the initial shortlist a couple of weeks or a couple of months down the line kind of stands out as being the one that you want to choose um, and then finally and this is really tricky if there are a lot of stakeholders involved just remember that not everyone is going to love the name and there are probably always going to be some lingering reservations and doubts um, but as long as you've got the main people on board those doubts and reservations in a year's time you might find they've disappeared so before we move on to questions um, one last thing to say um, is that naming processes can can be pretty brutal sometimes and they can feel uh, a lot like just saying no again and again, or at least being told no again and again. No, that name doesn't work because it doesn't communicate intelligence or no, it doesn't work in Latin America. A few weeks of that can pre feel pretty disheartening and make you feel like you're not getting anywhere. Um, we would say stick with it. Um, every rejected name is rejected for a reason. The more you can tease out that reason, the more useful it becomes. But every time, every rejection tells you more about the, the name you're looking for and I should hopefully move you one step closer to finding it. Okay, so I think we've got a few minutes left for questions. Um, I'm going to hand over to our other Sam now, Sam Pollen, who hopefully has some questions for us. I do indeed, and uh, thanks everyone. We've had some some uh, really good questions flying in. I think the question will be how many of them we managed to get <laughs> in the time we've got, to be honest. Um, and just one other thing to say, Jay mentioned a piece he's published on Medium um, about the naming process for Thimble. I dropped that in the chat just in case anyone's looking uh, to look at that themselves. Um, so the first one I was going to ask was, so I think a couple of people asked this, I think Haley asked this question, and Alberto asked something similar, was about presenting names. So I know you talked a little, little bit about this at the end, Sam, in terms of putting it in kind of some kind of context. Uh, but I think people were, were asking sort of, does that go along with design? Would you ever do that at the same time as presenting a name and kind of uh, how it might look across the kind of wider brand? And also just the practicalities of, e, do we tend to be presenting one name to start with or three names or a hundred names like how does that normally look as a process hmm. um well I'll, why don't i take that one first then maybe eli and mike you can jump in i think in, in terms of the number of names i think at read words we try and keep the that initial shortlist a shortlist so it it's kind of 10 15 maybe um we've seen some other approaches where it's a spreadsheet of hundreds of names with you know letter variations on a name personally I, I think that's a bit overwhelming for a client and it, it kind of just again looks like that that word jumble that slide we showed at the very beginning it's really hard to pay attention and give each name the attention it deserves so I think in terms of presenting keep it focused obviously there needs to be variety and range and flex and all those things but yeah try not to overwhelm the client because then it then it will feel like a, a word jumble game which rather than a kind of strategic consider the process also yeah. a question of value too that if you're you know if you're sharing 200 names what's the value of any mm. given name on that list exactly uh, it feels unconsidered yeah i completely agree i have seen presentations where people have literally put like 500 words in a deck yeah. um and i completely agree with you like and um, just in terms of how we present as well as a, a vexed question about you know do you just put the name in black type on a page or do you try and design a kind of uh, sort of a stand standalone logo or something and um, we tend to just put the name up but then we put some context around it so we give a kind of a little tiny sample of copy just to show it in a kind of context of a sentence or we'll, we'll have a little rationale in there and um, all the kind of points about is this dot com available etc so it kind of comes with a bit of contextual stuff around it um, uh, but essentially it's the name on a page I'm intrigued to know Eli if you do it any differently yeah, fairly similar. I mean, there's a, a balance you're trying to strike there where you want to give people a sense of context without putting enough sort of design or creative work on the table where people are reacting to something other than the name. Right. Um, 
And so that's, you know, feedback will tell you where you're sitting on that balance. If people start reacting to the colors you're using mm -hmm. or the way you mocked it up on a sign, then you went too far. Um, <laughs> if people are talking about the name, then you're probably in the right place. I think there's on the client side, there's an immense amount of anticipation, right? This is like the most important thing in your business and you just waited so long for this meeting and for this name. So what, what I find that Reed and others do is they really build up the anticipation to it. They're like 10 slides before you see the first name. Mm -hmm. uh, so you really, uh, you, you get, get really wound up, which I think is a, is a good thing. <laughs> That's good. <Yeah. laughs> um, so Russell asked a question about, um, we, we mentioned early on about some, about the kind of context of the name and some, some clients wanting to um, fit in or the one, others wanting to stand out. He was wondering what the kind of proportion of clients who fall into those camps is and, and you know, what, why would you want a name to, to fit in rather than stand out? Uh, I, uh, yeah, I, th I think the majority is, is stand out. Um, occasionally, if um, you're moving into a space that is full of, you know, brands that have been around for years, have lots of credibility and expertise and heritage, and that you're worried your brand might not match, then then yes, I think there's a you might want to slightly fit in. I think I think Telema is kind of example of trying to find a a, a balance between the two that. We want to be different, but we don't want to be so different that we seem kind of naive and amateurish. And so, yeah, I think occasionally some brands, and they tend to be the, the B2B brands, I must say, that yeah. there's, a, there's a slight nervousness about appearing too different and that we want to appear as though we belong in this world. Yeah, we've had a similar kind of thing to, sorry, Jay, similar thing with the bank we've just been doing. Um, as you can imagine, the bank, they're a digital bank. They want to appear to be kind of of the moment and you know ahead of the curve and all that stuff. But they also know they're they're a bank and they need people to trust them. So, you know, there are names that we put forward for them. Like one of my favourites was Canoe for various reasons, but that was just too much for them. It was too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a similar balancing act there of fitting into that context and people believing in you as a bank, but also feeling fresh. So I think as an insurance service, um, we didn't want a made up name. We didn't feel that a made up name would be as powerful as a real object that we could own. Um, and so that made the brief a lot harder, but that was something that we, we felt would pay off in the long run because people would trust something that they could reference as a, a real thing rather than something that was just a made up name. Yeah, it's really interesting. One other area to think about too is uh, naming architecture. Um, which is a place where sort of uh, descriptive and fit in names can be really useful. If you have a company name that's very evocative and out there and attention grabbing, you likely don't want to double down on that with all your product names because you're creating a situation where there's just too much stimulation. Um, so that can be a situation where, you know, fitting in, it's more just about like making sure people accurately understand your offer. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a great answer, Eli. It did steal my next question. <laughs> um, so, so a diff different question that came up was um, about testing. Um, obviously, we talked a little bit about that kind of selling into a client process, but do, do we ever be interested to hear from you, Eli, on, on this as well? Do you test names with users? Is that a process that's useful and, and fruitful, or is that just a recipe for disaster? Uh, I'd say to quote... Steve Jobs, people don't know what you want until <laughs> you tell them. Um, you know, naming is, uh, you, can, you can focus group names to death very easily. Uh, and, you know, in particular, I think the context thing that we've discussed, you know, earlier here is really important in that when somebody sees a name in the real world, it's not a question, it's not an option. It's, this is what it is, this is how it looks, are you interested or not? Um, and you know, what happens with a lot of methods of testing is you're really attempting to isolate the name as a variable, which doesn't exist in the real world. Um, you know, that's not to say there aren't ways to test names and there aren't aspects of names that can be tested. Memorability is something that you can test. Um, you know, so there's ways to approach it, but I think for the most part, testing sort of gets weaponized in this way that really just takes all the interesting stuff off the table and leaves people with sort of the most boring vanilla options. Yeah. yeah, I think I think Virgin as a name would never have got through a focus group in the 1970s, let's say. So no yeah, chance. I think I think we probably probably agree with that. Yeah, I'm conscious that we're a minute over, guys. Um, so sorry we didn't get through more questions. Um, 
Jay and Eli, thank you so much for the time you've given us on this. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, everybody else, for showing up. And this will, um, the recording of this will go on our YouTube channel if you missed it or you want to 